Hey everyone, just a quick announcement before we get started. We got a response from our Nancy Drew episode from someone named Nancy Drew Collector mm -hmm. on Instagram. <laughs> but I wanted to bring it up because they said that the most serious and well-known Nancy Drew collectors are men, and many guys prefer wow. it because wow. Nancy Drew tended to be more action-packed and more independent. So hmm. they responded to us with an answer to our question, which your question was you'd love to see the optics on who was reading these things. Yeah. And according to this person who knows all about it. Interesting. Uh, so yeah. men, because she was more, she was doing more cool stuff. Yeah. So if you have no idea what you're, <clears throat> what we're talking about, go check out the Nancy Drew episode, the one right before this. And if you want to write to us, let us know what you think about the episode. It's at illiterate pod on Instagram. Evan, here we go. All right, let's go. Welcome everybody. This is illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a book this week. I watched a movie this week. We are doing Jojo Rabbit. And oh. the book is Caging Skies. I'll read you the quick description of this. If you just don't, if you just happen mm -hmm. to not know what this is, a young boy in Hitler's army finds out his mother is hiding a Jewish girl in their home. The catch here is that Hitler is this boy's imaginary best friend. Like Calvin and Hobbes, if Hobbes was Hitler. <laughs> I saw it last night, and one thing I came away feeling was that crowd response to it was super warm. Um, mm. That was I felt like I was watching a movie with a bunch of people. It was very odd. Yeah, yeah. That it was, is. A, that it was is something a, overwhelmingly. I walked away with. Yeah, and it's it's touted as putting forth a message of spreading more love in the world and anti hate, and especially because it's from a child's perspective being indoctrinated into the Hitler youth and wondering what to do about this Jewish girl that's being a part of his family. The film is directed by uh, Taika Waititi, uh -huh. uh, who is also the director of Thor Ragnarok. Um, what We Do in the Shadows. Which, yeah, which now has a TV show as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, another film uh, that some people have, haven't have seen, Hunt for the Wilder People. I highly recommend it. It was 2016. He also directed some of uh, Flight of the Concords back in yeah, the day. So. Yeah, from New Zealand in that Massively, scene. massively funny. And he plays Hitler. He's the main dude. <laughs> he wrote, directed, and plays Hitler in the film. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a, a setup for the bonkers Lighthearted, it's satirical bonkers. take it on is. it. I read the yeah, I read the book Caging Skies, which is what this is based off of, and I say based off of very loosely because the premise of a young Hitler youth finding out that his parents are keeping a Jewish girl protected from the Nazis in their home, that is basically the only thing that is the same with this. It is completely different in style and tone and themes and message, I would even say. I am so blown away because, the. I mean, this film is so confident in yeah. its tone, in what it's trying to do, in the story it's telling. Yeah. I would have never guessed. Yeah, so we're going we're gonna to get to the connections of all of this, but first we've got to go through what is the book, who decided to make this thing, and then how did they get together <laughs> with this guy to make this movie. I'm, I'm fascinated. Yeah. A, like, how does this exist? We've certainly jumped timelines. <laughs> so the book <laughs> is, oh, the opening I liked, it was good. It was about seeing kind of how the youth could be manipulated. It's this kid who gets indoctrinated into the Hitler youth. His parents are obviously not involved in this, and it's from a first-person perspective. So he finds this Jewish girl in his house that his mother is obviously keeping. He lives with his mom and his dad and his grandma, and... That's the first third of the book. So I was like, okay, cool. I get it. But then it deviates wildly and his parents disappear. We find out his mom got hanged. His dad got sent to oh some gosh. camp or something like that. It's pretty ambiguous. But then it's just him and his senile old grandma and this girl who he is now falling in love with and spending more and more time with, though he's conflicted because she's obviously a lesser human being to him. So he holds her hostage, basically, because it's revealed to him that they are lost the war. And so she can be free, but he chooses to keep her holed up in this mm -hmm, house mm -hmm. and slowly lets her out like into the bedroom and into the whole house, all the while keeping it a secret from his neighbors and his grandma. 
until his grandma dies, and then it's just him, and it's for four years gaslighting and manipulating. Oh my god! And that's the second part oh of gosh. the book, and it's like I didn't even I just didn't want to keep oh reading god. it because it's so messed up. Oh, to god. the point where she oh, emerges wow. one point naked in the street, and all the neighbors see, and it looks like. You know, it's like one of those things where you hear about some girl who's been held captive in a house by some crazy person. Right? Yeah, yeah. But it's definitely, he's such a monster throughout the entire book. I had no empathy or sympathy for him at all. Oh, wow. Uh, he comes back one day and she's just gone. So after she leaves and he doesn't know where she is, he decides he's going to write down what happened and maybe she'll come back. And that is what this book is. So it's very, very. Oh my gosh! Strange. Well, the movie ends about halfway through what you just <laughs> what you just said. Yeah, the movie ends basically when the war is over, and and he struggles with whether or not to tell her for a moment, and you and they really play with with the audience there because you're like, well, you, oh no, please tell her. Like, tell when is he going to tell her? Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, 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 you know, very appropriately play that note, and then very, I think they lovely pay it off, and he lets her out into the world, and there's, but and, and it's built such to a point in such a different way, way more childlike and hopeful, hopeful, absolutely, uh, a to- like a. a uh, That's something uh, that I've heard about this movie is that the tone is very hard to pin down, which a lot of people are not keen on, where it's like, is it Wes Anderson, but in Nazi Germany, or is it too dark? You know, I think there's, it's there's... Wes Anderson with more, with more heart, I mean, and, and yeah. with playing with such dark stuff, but I think that really is disarming the beast here, which mm. I, 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 that's what I like to play. I, the movie is nothing but joy. And, and love and fun and fighting against all of those bad nature right. parts of us and talking about it and why and how we can think those things, why, how we can be manipulated. And the um, book and is And as nothing, children, yeah. directly, yeah. as children, how people, how children mm-hmm. can be manipulated. I mean, it can't be more direct. Yeah. The, the book is nothing but pain and misery and suffering and how it can go completely the opposite way. Uh, so the question then becomes how, who, who made the book and how did it get from this to that? And how are they both okay with that? Yeah, I'm, I mean, how in the world did did they agree? <laughs> you know, <laughs> to be, yeah, right. sure, go. Yeah. The person who wrote Caging Skies is this lady named Christine Lunens. She was born in Connecticut to an Italian mother and a Belgian father. As a teenager, she moved to Paris and lived with her grandfather, who was this famous Flemish painter. She became a print model, so she was like a supermodel mm. in Europe, traveling all across Europe. She's the, okay. She was the face of Givenchy, she, famous fashion brands. She was in this really famous uh, Mercedes-Benz ad, which I found a video of, so I'll post a link to that in the show notes. Mm. So she just lived this life of crazy, traveling around Europe, knowing three different languages, being a model. And she got her master's in English and American literature at Harvard, when she went back to the U.S. Dang, okay. And she was saying that while she was modeling, she wrote her family these 25-page letters, and she would go to the theater and just listen to the words. Like, you know you can't be a model like that and live that lifestyle forever. So she found that her passion was writing and words Hmm. and that kind of thing. And that's what she got her degree in. Yeah, that's cool. So her first book was in 1999, and it's called Primordial Soup. And it did pretty well. And then she moved to New Zealand in 2006, and I saw in an interview, and just as a heads up, there'll be links to all this kind of stuff if you're interested in that. All those tasty nibs. Yeah. In 2006, she moved to New Zealand to speak English. She said that was her reason. The interviewer was like, why did you move there? She was like, well, we, we looked, and she was like, I was losing English as my first language, and that's my tool and my craft. And if I start getting slacking sloppy on that, I won't be able to write. Uh, And so she looked at all the English speaking countries and just decided that that was going to be the best one for her family. Okay. Um, And so then that's where the New Zealand angle comes in. So she published Caging Skies in New Zealand in 2008 and got her PhD, her doctorate in creative writing at a university in New Zealand in 2012. I didn't know this was that recent either. No, I mean, I think it's kind of a shock to even learn that this the film is based on anything, and then to find out it's more recent. The book came out in 2008, yeah. As far as the adaptations go, and this is where we get into how is she okay with this, there was an adaptation of Caging Skies turned into a play, Mm. and it had its world premiere in Wellington in 2017. This is why I respect her for this, because the play, and a quote from one of these interviews, she said, the novel is mine, the play is yours. 
Mm -hmm. She's very, very accepting of artists to do what they need to do because obviously the play is going to be very different right. from the book. That takes a lot. Nobody and understands that hardly. Man, that's one of the hardest things. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And so as far as the inspirations for this book, she was saying her husband was working at the Memorial Museum for Peace in Europe when they lived in Europe, and they were living on the beaches of Normandy. So she, when she would come to visit him for lunch, it would just be like she would hear the bombs and the and the exhibits and the displays about the Museum for Peace. Oh, yeah. She said her biggest influence was one of her friend's parents hid a Jewish person during the war in their house. Oh, man. A huge influence, man. Man. Wow. And then that person who that's, was her... That's yeah. crazy. Uh, that person married. I mean, it was the gender sweat because it was a girl and they hit a guy and then she married that person and her parents and people around her were confused and not okay with it. Whoa. But that like literally happened in her oh, immediate social amazing. circle. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. So just to get that straight, restate that because I feel like I might be confused. Yeah. Restate the, how that worked. Her, one of her friend's parents gotcha. hid a Jewish person during the war. Wow. And, then, and then her friend, yeah, married that person. Wow. And her parents didn't approve of it. That's in, that's that's crazy. So total coincidence. I'm sure it had no bearing on <laughs> <laughs> on, on the entire story at all. No, so then how did that's this begin? So, so now we move on that's to okay, we up. get a little bit about her. Yeah. Cool, we got the book. They made a play. Nothing crazy. Yeah. So now how does this Taika YTT guy? Yeah, I'm wondering come how into does he picture? see it and then how does he go, I got something for it. Yeah. And just like you said, a little I bit. I wonder if he yeah. heard her say that and was like, Oh really? <laughs> Far artists are free to do what they want, huh? So well. here's 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 <laughs> well, let me go over here. So well, no, uh, well, here's how he found out about it. Just a little bit more context on him. He he faked being asleep at the Oscars when he got a nomination for the short film in 2005. I'll post a link to oh that video. God, I didn't know That's that. how he got I did not famous because he he was nominated for best short film in 2005 for this film he made in New Zealand about two kids, and this is where his interest in the child's perspective starts. Mm. and factors into her knowing about him is because that was a New Zealand mm -hmm. thing. She had just moved in 2006. He pretends to be falling asleep when they announce his name at the Oscars. And then he did this film, Boy, which came out in 2010, which is again from a child's perspective. Mm. He wrote the initial screenplay for Moana, the Disney film that came out in 2016, though he's uncredited oh, really? because oh, they really? completely, yeah, they changed it up. But he, he was the initial he got screenwriter. Paid. Yeah, <laughs> he got that money. <laughs> he got paid. Um, and then, like you said, Thor Ragnarok in 2017. And then he was set to do this film in 2019 about Bubbles, Michael Jackson's chimpanzee. <laughs> no way. Um, and got canceled or on hold no. or whatever. But he ended Bubbles, up... Bubbles, <laughs> no. <laughs> but he ended up doing this thing. And the way that he ended up doing this thing is it was... He said in an interview, which was very hard to find, but I ended up figuring it out. It and was, you got them links, boy. <laughs> I know you do. And New Zealand Public Radio. It was based on a description of a book his mom told him about. So his mom read Caging Skies <laughs> and kept ha harassing him about it. And she said, you need to read this. You need to read this. You need to read this. No way. So he then read it and was like, oh, this is dope. Let me go talk to her. So Christine gets a call out of the blue from him. She said, let me look at some stuff. So she saw Two Cars One Night, which was the short film that he did, and she saw Boy, and she saw that it was from the children's perspective. She thought it was, you know, weird, but then went ahead and accepted it. And like I said about her saying the play is yours, the novel is mine, mm -hmm. she said in an interview that I saw, she was like, I prefer an artist trying to do something new and take chances, even if the movie bombs. And they collaborated on it, and, she, and you know he went back to her. But it was like this Snaps is going to be something to totally different. And she was like, "I dig the Hitler character being an imaginary character because in the book, the dude is fascinated with Hitler, but it's from a kid's perspective, so he doesn't even really understand what it is, and he's lacking a father figure and looking for a father figure." And she's like, "In the book, you can personify that as his thoughts and him acting like he knows Hitler. So why not just turn it into?" An imaginary friend oh, or a character, man. and that becomes the boy's thoughts. I thought I thought the the device was so clear. It became, mm -hmm. I mean, it was so obvious to me. Uh, and the plight that this kid is stuck in, I mean, we've never seen anything like this before. Yeah, it just because it's uncomfortable, maybe it's totally valid. And 
and it really made me think about how hard this was leaning into the child's perspective mm-hmm. harder than I think I have almost ever seen anything really. Things I would have just never thought of that I go, why did you, oh my God. God, he's thinking like a like an eight year old. Yeah. Like it, it's it's incredible. He's and that's so like we said, a lot of it. his work is a, from the perspective of oh, kids. Yeah. And he was saying the reason that this work interested him beyond his mother telling him about it was because he, he said he had just learned about the war in Bosnia was at its twentieth anniversary of it ending, and he was like, I knew nothing about the war in Bosnia, so he was like, I'm going to start looking at this. Right. And then he was particularly like fascinated. Me, one of those nights, yeah, I sip on coffee and Red Bull, just oh, Bosnia in on those yeah. U- yeah. <laughs> YouTube docs, and that's what he was all about. And then he got fascinated by how that war specifically started affecting children, and. Mm. You know, and when an interviewer asked him why, so then why did you make it like this? And he was like, because I don't really know how to do straight drama, and I've no interest in doing that. And you can see that from his work, right? But as far as his influence, her influence, she spent five years doing research and got commended for what the day to day life was like being a person in Vienna in that time. And he said he did literally no research portraying Hitler because he wanted to take it fresh. What would right. a kid? What would think a kid about think this? about it? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It yeah. was it, it, absolutely, I think it comes across on the screen, that mm-hmm. decision. Um, and so, yeah, he, and then he said in, in their talks that uh, Christine said, please don't take this the wrong way, but I could see you as Hitler in this thing. Oh, so she really? was, she, she oh, was the no one that way. first came up with the idea. Of him doing it. It kept going around and around and around. And like I said, they, oh, had, wow. they had started this process in 2012. Well, but it's it the author saying you ought to do it, then I guess you got to do it. Yeah, yeah. That's, and that's amazing. <laughs> but nothing had happened. This was actually on the list of blacklist. The blacklist, for those that don't know, is scripts that are the hottest buzz in the film world, but are not entering principal photography yet for whatever reason. So this script, the hottest Jojo Rabbit, unproduced scripts in right, Hollywood. Right. This was on the blacklist for 2012. But it's interesting because what was also on that list was Story of Your Life, which became Arrival which was based on a book, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, which we did an episode on, Ted wow, Bundy, The Phantom yep. Prince. Uh, Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, which became a movie that mm-hmm. was also based on a book. The Fault in Our Stars was also on there. So this had the track to become something, but it didn't because they couldn't find the person. Eventually, what happened was Fox Searchlight asked him. They said, we'll make this if you play Hitler. What? That was the, that no was the ultimatum. Way. Yeah, because he had no intention to do it. They were like, we don't want it to be an insert famous person plays Hitler in this and that generate the buzz. So you have to do it. And then that's how it got to be made now. But it started with her way back then. I've never heard of anything like that in Hollywood almost. Like yeah. that's, that's, all, that's stunning because, I mean, when you're just watching it, you assume, oh, I mean, he, he just wanted to do it. He, he was an auteur. Child, he wrote it. He auteur, directed it. Yeah. Absolutely. He's got a comedic edge. No. Um, you know, he's never done anything like a starring role quite like, well, nothing quite like this. But mm-hmm. he's never really done a starring role, like yeah. a poster role for something. No, it so had, why it had not the, just the, yeah. if you're going to debut his acting chops at all? The studio talking about you know well talent and which way they can push him out. Now I mean now he can go on Jimmy Kimmel and now his face out there. Now mm-hmm. he is a brand. Taika is mm-hmm. a brand now. I mean he's really transcending mm-hmm. um, just the the even the the Marvel glam of it all. He mm-hmm. was an indie guy, uh, but smart as him to play. Mar- I mean, yeah, I mean I'm mean, really up. playing it smart. Yeah. Because, like I said, it was starting in 2012, and it didn't get made. And now people are looking at it, and they're like, oh, maybe there's some cultural relevance or political relevance or whatever, you know, things that are going on in the Mm. world now that you Mm. might want to ascribe it to. And he was like, that was never our intention. Like, we had plans to make it seven years ago. ago. Yeah. Yeah. It just happens that these things come around. Well, that just speaks to the beauty of the story, the relevance of the story. I mean, a good story Mm -hmm. will ring true. Yeah. As far as Hitler himself is being personified by actors and by right. people writing, it started since the beginning, even before Hitler really rose to power. Really? The first one that we really get into is called The Great Dictator, which is Charlie Chaplin's right. well, you satire. Think a lot of people have seen the, of Adolf. the speech, yeah. Yeah, and it's Very usually with the speech. Inception music underneath. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like this really grand 
masterful speech. But I found I mean, it's in the public domain, so I'll post a link to the entire movie that you can watch. <laughs> and I'd highly recommend it. It's really, really good, and it stands up even to now. This was the first sound film that Charlie Chaplin was in because really? he was a silent film star. Oh, yeah. Wow. So this is the first time you hear his voice. And it was interesting to me to see that even Charlie Chaplin has the same mustache. Hitler copied that. Hitler was very acutely aware of Charlie Chaplin. Really? And they were actually born four days apart. Whoa. And kind of like the Stan Lee, Hugh Hefner thing that we talked about in our Stan Lee episode, where it was like they kind of lived a very similar life and then took different paths yeah, they just on the same track. Path. Yeah, how like fascinating. Charlie Chaplin went to entertain and comedy and improve people's lives, and Hitler went to destroy them. Yeah. Um, but the filming for this, The Great Dictator, began in September of 39, right at the start of World War II. It was released in 1940 as the Nazis were occupying much oh of France. So, like, you look at it now, like, Charlie Chaplin, is, I'd seen in a, in a thing that he had said that he probably would not have made it if he had been fully aware of all the stuff that was going on in the concentration camps and all of that. Right. Because it is making fun and lighthearted and poking fun right, at right, right. an insane dictator. But he was like, I didn't, I didn't, we didn't Real know how been, crazy yeah. it was until after everything came out. Um, and there are rumors, and I couldn't corroborate this because it's the internet, but that it was sent to Hitler, and Hitler was known to have seen the Great Dictator, the movie really? that was that was making fun of him. But nobody could know. But apparently, according to somebody, that how that interesting. was interesting. I've yeah. never actually really thought about that before, and never really, I don't really put them in the same world. But you know. <laughs> I guess there's only one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that we know. Of. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say it's so odd, but yeah, I mean, yeah, not thinking about the idea of satire, and, but, and then realizing, oh yeah, maybe would have been maybe possibly aware of it, seeing it. Wow. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> like it was in the moment. Yeah, and then we go to our dear friend Dr. Seuss, who in 1958 came out with Yertle oh, no. the Turtle. And Refresh my memory. I don't remember this one. Yertle the turtle. Please. It's this turtle who's trying to be the main boss and is making turtles stack on top of each other and trying to be on the top and then it all crumbles down. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll have to and do if, some midnight reading. <laughs> <laughs> or go listen to our Seuss episode because we had talked about he had collabed with Stan Lee during World War II when they were making the, the training films. Right, 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 right. Together. How the lines intersect. Yeah. They keep intersecting. The biggest film, we're back to film from literature. The biggest one that people might know is in 1967, The Producers by Mel Brooks came out. And that was the springtime for Hitler. And it's yeah. the, the crazy musical. That's the most famous one that I was, was aware of. The most like comparable mm -hmm. to what I saw. I don't think Charlie Chaplin was explicitly Jewish. But Mel Brooks was. And he actually fought in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge. Whoa. I didn't know Mel Brooks yeah. fought. Wow. In Battle of the Bulge? That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Love him while he's still here, folks. Yeah, he's super old. Yeah, any day. Um, something interesting that I found, and if you know anything about this mm. and you're a listener, clue us in, because in apparently in India, they have no connection to Hitler, and so it is just used as a pejorative term for a stubborn person or is used in oh, reference no. to older people. It's so used they, like a middle school. Mm -hmm. oh, so no. they've gotten a lot of guff because it doesn't mean anything to them. It's so, And in Hinduism, the swastika has been around for a long time as an entirely different right, symbol. Right, to them, it's, re it's reappropriation already. It's the, yeah. yeah, yeah. I get that. I get the swastika portion of it for, for sure. I think there's a good argument for that. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, you gotta name. be culturally aware. There was a clothing store like H and M or whatever, just named Hitler with a swastika that came out in 2012, and people were like, "You gotta change that." And he was like, "Why? I named it after my grandfather." Like, legitimately, not knowing anything. So I, I don't know <laughs> anything the about that. Funniest thing I've heard this <laughs> yeah. week. I'll post a link to it, but it's like it's just the front of the store. It just says Hitler, and it's got a swastika over the eye. And what it's do a you mean? <laughs> My grandfather's name was it? Hitler. Yeah, we no, called. No, I'm my... not. That, hey, that costs money. Put that down. <laughs> yeah, wild. The last thing was very recently in 2015, there was a book that was written in German called "He's Here Again: Adolf Hitler Reawakening in His Bunker Inexplicably 70 Years Later," 
and in modern times. Oh god! And just is back back to basics, trying to take over everything. He is mistaken for a comedian, like a Hitler impersonator, who's just going full method acting and becomes a media phenomenon and a celebrity. Oh no! If you can't read German, though, it sold a million and a half copies in Germany, which is crazy. There was a film version, again, foreign with subtitles, but it's on Netflix and it's called Look Who's Back. I think I did see a trailer for yeah, this. And yeah, it's like Hitler trying to use the internet and trying right. to Right, I think I did see a trailer for this. Yeah. <laughs> Amongst um, one of the many uh, things I scroll across on Netflix and wonder <laughs> how in the world, how in the world somebody said, yeah, sure, here. Yeah, but it was Cut based on a, on a hugely popular selling book in Germany. And it's interesting because the, the concept of like, oh, he's back. And it's like, no, 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 it's, it's not, it's rather than him being back again, it's that that kind of mentality is always there, you know? Yeah. He can come back in a different form where he can not understand what's going on, but people might still gravitate to that. Yeah. Even if it's in the form of a comedian or a celebrity yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Modern technology, that kind of thing. But it's interesting because things like the swastika and the Hail Hitler salute are illegal in Germany. You're not allowed to have them. So the fact oh, that wow. the book got written and the movie got made with all that stuff in I didn't know times. that. I didn't know that the, the paraphernalia was illegal. Uh-huh. I want to a dim yeah, yeah, yeah. to the interpretations of Hitler because I think that Tyka made a callback to one of my personal favorite comedic interpretation in a show, an Australian show called Danger Five. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Danger Five uh, only did two seasons, but it was a highly stylized show that uh, had a, uh, a strictly '60s Star Trek kind of vibe. But it was about a task force that was trying to stop Hitler in World War II. So they used like model planes, and it looks like Godzilla and, and Star Trek and all that kind of stuff. So it's wildly wacky, wildly funny. And one of the running gags that they have is that Hitler is always ousted and then jumps out a window. That is like <laughs> his exit for every for every scene. And so twice, actually, Taika as Hitler gets kicked out. Or he the first time he actually throws himself almost exactly the same way, mm. classically, that Danger 5 does it. And I go... Oh my God, he's seen Danger Five because nobody's seen Danger and Five. I want to spread Danger too. Five. Yeah, <laughs> and and I'm and I'm like, oh my God, he's seen Danger Five. Of course, Australian. He oh New Zealand. <laughs> of course, he's seen it. Oh, he yes, yes, Danger Five. So uh, Danger Five. I just wanted to insert that yeah, because yeah. that is near and dear to my heart. But that is another another comedic uh, interpretation of him. And they're not even really saying anything. They're not serious saying or much about anything. it. They're but, it's just another example of trying to deconstruct the monster here. What can be used for? Um, and it's completely absurd. It is absurd. Spy film. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. So if you're into that, look for that. I'll post a link to that as well. It's on Netflix, I think. Yeah. I th it was at one time. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. But post a trailer at the very least. But yeah. So now that we know all of these interpretations of how Hitler is represented, I was fascinated by how dictators also know literature and are involved in literature or interpretations of themselves mm -hmm. and utilize that like you said about how charlie Chaplin oh interesting yeah was where hitler would have been hitler aware. would have been would have been aware of him which yeah, yeah i'm just kind of it hurts <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's interesting to me there was an article called what can we learn from dictators literature which i'll post a link to by daniel calder and there's also a book which is a longer version of it called the infernal library and so he did a ton of research on that they were prolifically literate and wrote themselves. Mm -hmm. Lenin, Stalin, Saddam Hussein, Mao, Mussolini. And if you want to not have history repeat itself or play the same melody, look at things that people have written that are aspiring to power or are in power and maybe see a similarity. So for example, Mussolini wrote a novel called The Cardinal's Mistress, which is this historical thriller kind of story. Sounds so Saddam mysterious. Hussein wrote four novels in the last years of his regime. Four? I didn't know that. Along Among them, one of them is a historical romance. What? Yeah. <laughs> Are uh, you telling me he wrote fiction? Yeah, yeah. Mao and Stalin and Ho Chi Minh have poetry you collections. Move on like it's nothing. He, <laughs> he wrote them wrong. Okay, okay, all right, moving on. Sorry, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Go pick up Saddam Hussein's Rome, Rome, historical, historical romance. romance. <laughs> Kim Jong-il issued treatises on opera, journalism, and cinema, like Roger Ebert-style reviews. On that makes me, I, I, like, I'm not shocked by it. Like, that's funny, <laughs> and like, it's almost a little like, whoa, really, he's doing that? But like, I get that. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the other is a bit. But Good I think you can, you can pick a lot of the similarities between who they end up being, what they're mm-hmm. about. You could even figure out probably a heck of a lot of what Saddam Hussein was into Just based on yeah, how he was writing characters. Man. They're windows into the mind. Yeah, yeah. At least in some form or fashion. I mean, I know that the, the work is not the writer, but some somewhere you're going to get some sort of insight, perhaps. Yeah. Not only the insight into what they wrote, but this is a, a totally wild off-the-wall article, but it's about what they read as well. Oh, even so this more thing, fascinating. There's Hitler's collection of personal books that he oh, has. Oh, what was in he his, into? In his library. They found this in a salt mine, haphazardly stashed in schnapps crates with the chancellery address on them. Who knows who had pillaged them or parceled them out. And they only kept the ones that had specifically like to Adolf Hitler written in the cover or printed with his seal or whatever, because you never know. They're only verifiable. Yeah, the only exactly 100% verifiable, which is like less than 10% of that collection. But they exist in the Library of Congress, around 1,200 volumes. You can go there to the rare books section and check them out five at a time if you want. (laughs) And flip through them. So in this article, you can just go take it and just read it and handle it with your greasy hands, (laughs) with your grubby little paws. (laughs) You can just rub all over it. You can sniff it if you want. (laughs) But just all the different things that you could say, like, oh yeah, Adolf Hitler. Like this is the pencil that he used, and why was he underlining these passages about spirituality or these passages in a book of poetry or writing in the margins or who sent him this book and how come he didn't read it at all because it's pristine and would why is this the page is yellow <laughs> yeah. you know this is what this details but i just thought it was interesting how anybody can just go see that i guess all it's the not... books marked a quality or just cellophane <laughs> <laughs> never open yeah just the re-gifts <laughs> I guess the question then becomes, why are we talking about all this? Why is this movie being made? What are the takeaways? There's so many different ways that you can look at history and something of this caliber and this monstrosity and enormosity. It's been done time and time and time and time and time again. I think we'll be covering this for the end of, you know, until the end of mankind. Mm -hmm. So at some point, I suppose we were going to reach this point. And here we are. Um, I don't know exactly... And I hesitate to say the effect of using horrific iconography in a comedic way. But you don't think that that works anymore, or you think it's been done? Well, I all I'm saying is I don't I don't know what's what the next thing is going to be right. because this is okay. I mean, I I feel fine with where the Jojo Rabbit lands on the obscenity, you know, just yeah, how, yeah. yeah. But does it give license to people to not do their research or not do it? Or more, the more distance you have on it, the less clarity you the might. More, and that's a, it's a reasonable The more lenses assumption. you put on it, and the more because now nobody, we've done this, so yeah. now the floodgates come, could open. I don't, you know, and I don't, that's not a legitimate worry, but... You know, I don't know what, what in 10 years, what are, what are we going to be saying? Well, about? nobody will have, that is living, ex- actually experienced Nazi Germany. Right. And so everybody is just putting up their interpretation of what that was like based on somebody else's recollection of it. And so do you lose the horror of what it actually meant? Does it, like you said, does it begin to become a copy of a copy? Right. That is copy? my, that's my thing. I, I, you know, I think, I think you should be able to use what you want. I mean, mm-hmm. I think there's no better way than to just say it. But I worry about quality control after the fact. It's a fine balance between. It really, it really, really is. Between reverence and respect. And that's what. Taika said in an interview, he was like, I'm paraphrasing, he was like, I never came to set being excited to play Hitler. I think that that, and that's again why it was so hard, and they didn't want a celebrity to do it, because then it would be about the celebrity being Hitler. He was like, I never wanted to treat it like, oh, what an honor. Who would want to do that? This is such a fun thing to do. He's like, no, no, no. Like, I never wanted people to think that this was something that I wanted to do or that was good, which is why he did no research and put forth no effort because he was like, I want it to show that he's a doofus. I mean, I just assumed that it was his idea, but learning that it was really just coming from all sides at him and it was the last thing he wanted is really just another part about this project that just astounds me. Mm. Um, It's everything you wouldn't think 
confidently uh, straying into the into the unknown here. Uh huh. But I mean, with just the best intent behind him, I feel like yeah, you can't say enough about it. Yeah. Well, go see the movie. It's in very select theaters right now. But yeah, I think it should be widening place. out, and, and I'm sure it'll be on streaming. And if you want a complete opposite, holidays. yeah, if you want a complete opposite, go read the book, Engaging Skies. Yeah. I mean, it sounds fascinating. I mean, I imagine it's grueling. The the cautionary tale. It's the other. It's the other side of it, and it's and it goes on for far longer. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Or that, any that's of the number, like I said, that will the, the show notes are blasted with links. It's also how you get in contact with us. Yeah, let us know what you're thinking about. Let us know what you're watching, what you're what you're reading. Connect with us at IlliteratePod. And we will catch you all on the flip-flop. See you soon!